there. So it's been a long, kind of intense couple of days. So if your attention span is getting kind of short, you're in luck because there will indeed be a lot of gifts in this talk. Um, so this talk, uh, it's kind of about my experience learning Scala at work as a uh, web developer and functional programming on the job as a web developer um, coming from PHP and how I think the Scala compiler isn't really optimized for that use case. So it's a little bit at the intersection of two talks that I love from yesterday which is Sophia Cole's talk about um, learning Scala, and um, Adelbert's talk about how the Scala compiler can help you. Um, so I'm going to talk about that. I'm also going to show you a lot of Arrested Development gifts, and hopefully I'll at least partially justify that decision um, along the way. Um, and if you're not familiar with Arrested Development, I think it'll still be fun. Also, all four seasons are on Netflix, so you should check it out. Um, so to start with, I'm going to explain a little bit about my background and my experiences with Scala at work, because it's fairly relevant to this talk. Um, so in my last role, I worked at Etsy on search ranking. I currently work with Randy at Giphy on the search analytics team where we use Scala both in the analytics context with Spark and uh, as of fairly recently in the applications context, which you heard Randy talk a little bit, bit about in the Giphy Cube talk earlier. Um, but I first started learning Scala at Etsy way back in 2013. We were using a Twitter library called Scalding to write um, MapReduce jobs. And essentially, the idea of how this language fit into our, our ecosystem, which was mostly PHP, is that after you develop something and ran an A-B test, and we had a GUI for getting basic statistics about your A-B test, um, if you needed some more insight that wasn't available in our, our graphical UI, then you would write a scalding job that would aggregate over our event logs and produce whatever insight you needed to, um, to launch your project. So how this kind of worked out is that most people's first and maybe only experience with Scala is that it was right on their critical path between finishing a big project and shipping it, receiving praise, and moving on with their lives. Um, and so, you know, I'm a very feature-motivated engineer, so personally this wasn't a very welcome kind of introduction of a new technology to that flow. Um, and so as you all know, Scala is a very lovely and elegant language, but it's also a big language with a lot of features and idioms, and we were almost fully a PHP shop, so it's fairly different from our day-to-day -to -day tool set. Um, and it also came coupled with a bunch of other concepts, like Hadoop and distributed file systems in general, MapReduce as a computing pattern. And then there's also Scalding as a framework, plus a lot of Etsy-specific code and implicits and utilities and things like that. Um, and it adds up to be a lot to learn at once. And the Scalding elephant is on fire for some reason. And suddenly everything's on fire, and your launch is blocked on your ability to metabolize many individually very significant ideas um, all in parallel. Um, and these are <laughs> some fairly dramatic slides, but this isn't really meant to be a knock on Etsy or on any of these technologies at all. It was really a blessing to have access to, you know, a world-class, cutting-edge data and infrastructure. But I think some of us in the feature development community at Etsy ended up kind of thinking about ramping up in the stack as being a bit of a side quest. Um, and didn't take the time to learn the language or the ecosystem like we should have. And so even with fairly good intentions, you know, you could have an overwhelming first exposure to Scala. Um, it's also not unique to Etsy. We've had some of the same growing pains at Giphy, using Scala in the service context, trying to learn functional programming, JVM principles, high-level microservices best practices, ACA, and as you might guess from the slide, a Java-based dependency injection framework. Um, and so this is really a fairly common experience, I think, because uh, Scala's massive success, especially in new and rapidly evolving contexts like big data and microservices, means that people learning it on the job often have a lot of new ideas coming at them all at once and a lot to, uh, to metabolize. Um, so what does any of this have to do with the Scala compiler? How am I possibly going to justify the clickbait title about Lucille Bluth? Um, well, I think it can be tough once you've gained fluency with the language and a set of tools to remember what it was like to be in the weeds with it. Um, and I have one really great, unique resource, which is that I'm a compulsive tweeter and have been for a long time. So I have a bunch of old tweets from back when I was learning Scala and help me remember what was confusing to me about it um, when I was getting started. Um, so at some point, I started writing a lot more jobs. I hadn't really embraced using an IDE yet. So I was writing Scala and Vim, and my primary contact point to the language was my build tool and the error messages I'd get when my build failed. Um, and I was frustrated by them. And so I tweeted that, um, that the Scala compiler reminded me a little bit of Lucille Bluth. And if you're not familiar with this character, she's kind of like Mr. Burns meets uh, Dorothy's mom from Golden Girls. She's kind of a little evil, but a little fun. <coughs> um, and so for a while, every time I had an error message that I found to be kind of opaque or imperious or jargony, I would tweet it out with this Lucille Bluth gif, just because it made me laugh to see them juxtaposed um, and made it more fun to debug. So a lot of these next slides are just adapted from those, those tweets from back in that day. Um, so one of the first error messages I tweeted about was actually a warning. Um, a pure expression does nothing in statement position. 
Um, and this is just classic Lucille Bluth. It's so imperious and aloof and self-centered. Um, and my issue with this message is, you know, it uses the language of compiler internals and functional programming jargon to give you a fact about the way that your code's interpreted, but not guidance on what's wrong with it in the first place. So pure, you know, is functional programming jargon for no side effects. And I think the average functional programming beginner would understand no side effects a lot better than pure, um, and that language would be more accessible. Um, and also, my guess is that a lot of people are coming across it in this specific way. So let's imagine I miss PHP a lot, and I want to write an echo function, which is really just the identity function on a string, very simple. Um, so this code, which looks fairly innocent, would generate this warning. Um, and if you've hit this before, I think it'll be obvious why. And if not, maybe take a look at it and see if you can guess. Um, it's pretty easy to do. It's actually just a typo, because omitting an equal sign from a function declaration means the function becomes type unit. And that means that the function body here, str, does nothing, isn't evaluated or returned, so it's pure. Um, so now, imagine that I don't get around to rebuilding and catching that warning, where I see it and I ignore it, because I don't understand it. And I move on to write another function that, for whatever reason, just uses the original function. Um, and so I'll call it echo twice, and have it print the string twice. Um, so in the second function, generates an error, actually. And now when I'm debugging this, who cares about the warning? I'm, I'm concerned about the error, and that error is uh, scrutiny is incompatible with pattern type. <laughs> so this is somewhat of a contrived example, but I actually found someone asking for help debugging this exact issue. I'm missing an equal sign leading to the scrutiny um, is incompatible with pattern type problem. And I think this, this message to me is so awful. <laughs> Because what is a scrutiny? You know, I've programmed in many languages, and I've never come across this term scrutiny before. And I think it's easy in an uncomplicated case, if you understand basics about pattern matching, to guess, you know, this is an invalid type and a match statement or a deconstruction. But, you know, the jargony sound of scrutiny might reasonably make someone wonder if they're dealing with an unusual problem, something related to the type system that they haven't come across yet and don't understand, and not immediately walk it back and find the bug. It's also just kind of an arcane way to describe what could be called the target or the subject of a match expression with, I think, a little more clarity. It's the same kind of issue as pure statement position, where it's optimized for someone who's already familiar with the internals of the language, which is the person who's least likely to come across one of these basic errors. Um, and of course, ambiguous implicit values, which is such a pain for beginners, especially because it's not often a direct function of code that you've written yourself. Um, and to me, that just pairs with the classically seal bluth, I know something you don't know, wink. Um, and I really liked in Adelbert's talk yesterday when he was talking about debugging implicit state as being kind of tribal knowledge. Um, and it really is a form of expertise. Um, and in any case, it's a great excuse to use this gif of this terrifying wink. Um, so <laughs> so the next one, it, it's one I thought was just kind of funny. It's a simple type mismatch, um, but large tuple types always look really absurd. So I paired it with this gif just because it's kind of silly and ridiculous on its face. Um, and this was an issue that would come up with scalding a lot because it involved cascading pipes with many, many fields. Um, and so this, this kind of error was fairly common in that context. Um, and it also reminded me of the first time I hit the tuple limit. You know, it's such an arbitrary thing, and the error message just kind of shuts you down. Too many statements, not allowed. Um, and if you go to Google this and try to find out why is the tuple limit 22, a lot of the resources say you're doing something wrong and your code is poorly structured, which, you know, it may be true, <laughs> but it's kind of not the nicest experience. And when you're in this moment of curiosity about something that's legitimately fairly arbitrary um, to hear, you know, you're doing everything wrong. Um, in any case, that big tuple type mass mismatch doesn't even uh, compare to this one. So after I proposed this talk, someone who'd seen the proposal, um, Persistent Cookie on Twitter, sent me this one, which I think is a much funnier example. Um, and there's a lot going on here. You have the type bound annotation. There's this numbered type A4, which might be new. Um, but of course, what stands out is GADT Skolem because it sounds like a monster. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and so I'm kind of on the fence about this one, because it combines kind of the worst of Scala error messages, which is showing you type annotations in text that you couldn't really hope to Google um, because it's just symbols. Um, but when, in fact, it's expressing something that's as simple as a subtype relationship. Um, with this GADT Skolem name, which at least gets you started with something that you can look up and has great SEO. Um, and in fact, if you look this up, uh, there, I don't have time to explain it, but there's some great resources online. And if you look it up, you find uh, Scala committers helping people debug this and get themselves out of this, which I think is one of the best parts of the Scala community. So in a way, um, this, this message is really on the right track in terms of discoverability. Um, so I poked a lot of fun at Scala, but I'm actually a really big fan of the language. Um, it's elegant and expressive. It's a massive benefit to have interoperability with other JVM languages. The strong typing with type inference is the best of both worlds. Keeps us from shooting ourselves in the foot. I'm sure if I were trying to do the same talk about PHP, 
you would just see a lot of Joe Bluth, because it's very easy to uh, make a huge mistake a lot easier than in Scala. Um, and for one last tweet, one thing I really also love about the Scala community is that there's some great resources for getting a baseline understanding that makes these kinds of error messages a lot easier to parse. For me, taking Odersky's Scala Coursera, functional programming in Scala, really changed my experience by giving me insight into the language design decisions that underpin a lot of these common issues. Um, and I think that folks working on the language are very open to feedback on how to make it more approachable and friendly. Um, in fact, since I proposed this talk, this PR for configurable error reporting update was started, um, which is aimed at least partially at language friendliness. Um, and you could imagine you could harness it to create maybe something like a more beginner-friendly compiler mode with references to the excellent uh, learning resources that are available, or even something as simple as providing like natural language information about type relationships rather than ungoogleable sequences of, of characters. Um, so my mission for this talk has, was accomplished before I even made my first slide, um, and that's really great. So thank you guys so much for listening. Um, I hope this was fun for everyone else because it was a lot of fun for me, obviously, to put together. Um, so thank you.